James Sullivan, let's get to your views on China. It is uh, a reflection of what we're already seeing at this point in time. I mean, the demand within China is looking like lost, but, you know, the health of the global economy seems pretty resilient. Look, I, I think that's absolutely the narrative to, to speak to. There's really three critical things that we're focused on on China uh, at J.P. Morgan. Number one, the continued strength in export data continues to indicate that this narrative about supply chain decoupling and supply chains moving out of China, there is no basis in the data for that claim. So it is a narrative without any support. And that's a critical recognition if we're thinking about the forward growth potential of the Chinese market. So that's critical element number one. Critical element number two is the fact that investor positioning on our estimates is now back to an underweight position in China. So you saw that dramatic market move to the upside from November to mid-January. And then we've basically seen weakness since. We saw investors square positions into mid-January. We're now back in an underweight position. The third leg of the stool is the SOE reform that we're seeing. Not shockingly, if you pay people for different things, they do different mm -hmm. things. The likelihood of improving returns out of the SOE sector is very high off the back of that reform. You put all that together, and it's starting to create a scenario for significant outperformance of the China market on a medium-term basis. Well, there are expectations, though, that PBOC will, well, feed in stimulus, and that will be supportive of Chinese stocks. And we're already starting to see that. I think, again, one of the critical narratives in China, there was an expectation that this would be more a more consumption-driven recovery than we've seen in the past. That's not actually occurring, and the data is supportive of the argument that the government is pushing on the same levers that it's pushed on historically, which is largely industrials as well as construction. And you're seeing significant strength in both, particularly if you look at construction PMI in China right now, it's at its strongest level since October of 2018. So we're going back to the same old growth model, and that is triggering significant upside to medium-term projections. James, these figures uh, perhaps flatter to deceive even, you could argue, given the base effects. I mean, Shanghai, for one thing, was in lockdown at this time last year, and various other parts of China were too. And, and that's, uh, look, it's critical to recognize that we have so many conflicting headwinds, tailwinds at this stage in multiple elements of the global economy. So I'm sure we'll get to, to central bank conversations in a second. It's important to recognize, feel, feel slightly sorry for your local central bank governor at this stage, because there is so much conflicting data. For China, the critical element from November of last year through now is we've already had the reopening trade. Frankly, for most investors, it was about the 10th time that they played the reopening trade, so it went faster and more aggressively than what we've seen in other countries. So now the incremental question is, what is reality for economic growth? We think we go back to, frankly, the same old drivers, but particularly important to the narrative is we are not seeing supply chain relocation out of China, and the recent export numbers are indicative of that. So, James, what kind of uh, picture is it painting with the uh, weak import uh, figures here as well, telling us something about the domestic economy? It doesn't actually then explain some of the, the, the frenzy we're seeing right now for banking and brokerages uh, stocks. Uh, you know, what are you making of that, and how do they reflect fundamentals, if at all? So the incremental consumption trends uh, in China continue to be somewhat challenging, particularly relative to very heightened expectations. What we're seeing right now is strength really in the core industrial manufacturing space. What's interesting to me is the divergence that we're seeing in the tech sector. You're seeing reasonably strong tech exports out of China, again, indicative that we're not seeing significant supply chain relocation. That's coming on the heels of actually very weak tech exports coming out of Korea and Taiwan. So you are getting this bifurcation in the tech space here in Asia right now. If you think you're going to be underweight China because China is going to slow down, then you would be underweight EMs as well? So at the moment, we're overweight China uh, on the argument that we have very light positioning, SOE reform, as well as, frankly, just a fundamental misunderstanding of the forward narrative in terms of supply chain relocations and things of that nature. So you put that together, and we do see the opportunity for medium-term performance out of the China mar market right now. I think the criti critical element for emerging markets is really looking country by country. The core risk space for us right now is really ASEAN. And if you look historically, ASEAN as a block has traded down anywhere between 20 to 40 percent in between the last rate hike and the first rate cut. And so we're in a relatively dangerous period of time for risk on trades, which ASEAN historically has been.